And uh, anyway, we're going to get into the Lord's tithes and our offerings. All right. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. uh, It says, if you want to turn in your Bible, you don't need to, but I'll read it for you. It says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. And we're going to get into that a little bit further today. Another scripture to kind of back that up is Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Somebody say them. The other people. They heard the good news as well as we did. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Well the author tells us because it was not mixed with faith. In those who heard it, God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. So our understanding that he is the Lord of all, our understanding that he needs to be first. When we have that understanding and adjust our lifestyle according to that, even with setbacks, trials, trauma, God, we refuse to change our mind. You are good all the time. And you take care of us. You take care of our families. You take care of our country, Lord. You are working all things out for good. And if it's not good, you're still working. But I want you to be working in my life. And me, when you look down, when you, however God does that, when the eyes of the Lord, it tells us in scripture, go about the earth looking for faith. He's looking for faith, right? Right? So I don't want to be at home saying, oh, poor me. Oh, my poor finger. Why me? No, I want to be here lifting up my hands saying, God, I trust you. Why is not even in the equation? We're just going to leave that and we're going to say, yes, Lord. We're going to say, God, we believe, we want, we ask, we petition. God, do it in your people. Release the glory. Have your way. Amen. So let's make a declaration over our tithes and offerings this morning. You know that you're the prophet of your own destiny. Your mouth has, your words have power, right? So let's put that up there. Thank you. Here we go. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, and divine manifestations, anointings, giftings, and calls, positions, and promotions, provisions, and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me so that I have more than enough to get and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. All right. We'll take that up this morning. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on, just to put this plug in while we're taking that, I'm going to do a bit of a series on angels, demons, the Nephilim, UFOs, which you know the modern term is UAP? Is it UAP? No. NASA doesn't call them UFOs anymore. Unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah, they're UAPs. And it's a real thing. I just want to let you know, like, the government in the United States actually had a a, a Congress meeting about it. They claim they have wreckage, uh, and it's actually a private company that has the wreckage. They've had it since the 40s, late 40s, early 50s of spacecraft. They claim a couple of spacecraft, they think, collided. And uh, I'm going to speak on that. I I don't know if I'm going to do it on a Wednesday night or series. Uh, We're going to get into it a little bit today. Uh, Einstein was the first one with his theory of relativity that really kind of, you know, lit up science with his theory of relativity. But 
Einstein was actually frustrated because he couldn't bring gravitational pull and I believe it was time into his theory. But I'm I'm just going to give you a couple of things to intrigue you. In the 80s, science realized that our universe that we live in has at least 10 dimensions. And there's a name for that. I think they call it a string. So our universe that we live in has 10 dimensions. So what, what science is saying for terms such as hyperspace, and one of the theologians that I've been studying, listening to said that if you really want to understand walking in the spirit, you need to understand hyperspace. So Jesus, when he was crucified and rose from the dead, he didn't send an angel to roll the stone away so that he could get out of the tomb. He sent an angel to roll the stone away so the disciples could see in the empty tomb. He didn't need it. And there's multiple references of scripture when the disciples were together in the upper room and they were, the doors were locked because of fear of the Jews. The Bible records that Jesus appeared to them. He manifested because Jesus, when he was in his glorified body, was now multidimensional. He could step out of one dimension into another. And that is when you have a spiritual experience, when there's a miracle that takes place. What we're doing is we're seeing something in another dimension come and manifest in this dimension. Remember the Tower of Babel in in Genesis 11? Do you know that theologians believe that it was actually, uh, it's a zergot, I believe, is what they were building. And they, they weren't building, as a kid, I was told they were going to build a high, 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 high tower so you could go up really, really high and try to touch God. That was not the point. They were building a monument that the gods could come down. They were trying to get back to the days of Noah. Because, see, before the flood, the reason why God sent the flood was because man was so wicked. What was happening was the Nephilim angels, fallen angels, were having sexual relationships with the, the, the earthly women and producing this super race. And God sent the flood and wiped it all out. But there, what they were trying to do, t- building the Tower of Babel, was to get it back again. They wanted it again. And instead of the gods coming down to do this again... God himself came down and said, enough of this. I'm going to confuse the languages. Why I'm telling you this is we're seeing a very similar thing today. Now, the punishment for the angels that did have sexual relations by taking on some sort of a humanistic form, the punishment for them was everlasting chains and darkness. So the chances of that happening again are slim to none. But they want to alter and mess up your DNA. Do you know why Noah was chosen to go on the ark? He was found righteous before God. But if you study it out in the original language, Noah's line had not been tainted by the Nephilim. It was a pure seed from Adam and Eve. His, ju- his line. That's why his family, because we are actually descendants of Noah. Does that make sense? Are you intrigued? <sighs> anyway, we're going to get into more of that in the coming weeks. Just to give you a little more information, because I think you're going to see a lot more alien stuff when it's really the demonic. These guys are waiting. I'm like, why are they standing there? They're waiting to count the offering. And you guys are waiting. Lord bless. I'm not on drugs. I'm on (laughs) Tylenol 2s and just over-the-counter stuff. God, thank you for these tithes, these offerings. Thank you for these people today, God. Your blessed generation of giant killers that are here in this house, God. We bless every business, God, every family, every future entrepreneur, every marriage, Lord, represented in these baskets, God. I thank you that we trust you with our finances. 
and that you are opening up the windows and pouring out such a blessing. We don't want to contain it. We want to give it away in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. That was a long uh, introduction for Wednesday coming and a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to get there in my notes. Where's Cameron? Is she back in the house? I think I saw her here. There she is. They took our easel, Cameron. What were they thinking? We so missed you last week, Cameron, but I know you were bringing life at a wedding or somewhere. Uh, I just have to make sure. Open the right... This is it. Okay. So last week, does anybody remember what, what we wrote on the board? You guys are going to get smart. You're going to start writing it down and you're going to have it ready. And I think I heard it. Your past can't stop you, but your current beliefs can. This week... We're talking about if I'm going to live at a higher level, and if you have a Bible this morning, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if I'm going to live at a higher level, I have to operate forward slash, conduct my life from a higher level. Does that make sense? Right? So last week we talked about what we believe is more important than what we do. And actually most people in the past had it switched around. What, what they do is more important than what they believe. And they live life out of experience. So when they come to a church like this and we're declaring healing and we're declaring scripture and the power of God and they're like, yeah, I tried all that stuff and it doesn't work. Well, that tells me then that you have an idol of your brain. Meaning you are putting your life experience above the power of the word of God. So we have to, there's a war going on, a battle of the mind. We have to believe, we have to trust in him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. We need to lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him. Wait a minute, God, you're, you're greater than this. God, for every problem that I encounter, there is a solution. That, that has to be the mindset. Not, oh, I heard this is going to happen and they're doing this in society and our kids can't get a house or we can't get a job or my relationship is this or that. Wait a minute. If I'm going to live and operate from a higher level, meaning I'm a Christian now, I have access into unlimited favor, knowledge, Resource. See, knowledge puffs up, but what we're looking for is revelation because revelation will empower you. So what do I mean by that? Well, for thousands of years, lots of great Sitka spruce trees were growing, but nowadays we know that I believe it's Piper Cub airplanes are made out of Sitka spruce. Man figured out he had a revelation how to make an airfoil, cover it with fabric, and that that law of lift would overcome weight and drag. I've used this experience before, but it was a revelation. Well, we are now realizing science. Science is catching up with the Bible. Scientists realize the power of vibrations, the power of sound, the power of light therapy, you know, there's, there's machines you can buy now. I, I know my dentist use, uses one. 
that when they do an extraction or something, they book an appointment, you come in and they put a laser on your gum and this wide spectrum of light therapy, whatever it is, promotes healing. I've been studying, there's a patch you can now buy. It's about $6 a day and you put it on your body and it's light therapy and people are raving, you know, people are saying this new light therapy, it's non, it, it, it's non-chemical or whatever, it, it promotes stem cell growth in your body. People are starting to step up and, and they're against the pharmaceutical industry saying, you know, it's just been drug on drug on drug. What about natural healing? You know, we've, we've got some people in this, this house that they're, they're operating with, with different natural products to promote healing where people are finding out that, that joy, you know, I watched a video this week. It had 11 million views on, on YouTube. This guy was an MIT graduate neurosurgeon that did back surgeries as well for 10 years and he quit. He quit it all. He walked away from it because he took the oath that doctors take that they are to alleviate suffering. And he says, I was not alleviate suffering. He said, yes, I helped some people, but I, I noticed that the industry that I was in was for making money. He quit. He, he didn't have anything bad to say about the hospitals he worked at. Like he said, you know, I worked with some great people, but he said the system that I was in was broken. He said, you know, there were times that things were beneficial, but he said the people over 10 years, I, and this is an intelligent man. He said, I watched people that I would schedule their surgery and before their surgery, they would get healed. And he, he described those people. They were happy. They had a sensible diet. They had community. He listed these eight or nine things that promoted healing in the body. And he said the people that even that I operated on, that the, the, the surgery went perfect. They didn't get better. And, and he listed their traits. They were negative. They, they, they uh, isolated themselves. They had no uh, outlet in their life. They're overweight, poor diet. Whatever. And so, of course, I'm watching this non-Christian secular video and I've got scripture after scripture after scripture just running through my mind that the local church, when, I'll just say she, but the local church, when she is operating the way she is supposed to operate, meets all the criteria for healthy bodies. Community, meeting one another's needs, having one-on-one -on -one relationships, fellowship, believing there's, a, there's an element of faith and hope. You know, there was a study done. I, somebody told me recently there was two, doctor, two patients and their files got mixed up. One had cancer and they had a terminal report. They were given six months to live. The other patient, they had done the scans, whatever, they were cancer-free. They mixed the files up, God forbid. So the guy, that, the guy that had cancer was told he didn't have cancer. The guy that didn't have cancer, was told he did have cancer. Within six months, the guy that was told he had cancer that didn't have cancer had cancer and ended up dying from it. The guy that was told... Anyway, you know what I'm going to say. The one that was told he didn't have cancer, but he did actually have cancer, went home and, wow, I'm cancer-free, praise, thanked the Lord, had joy, had parties, whatever went into remission and was, was healed. If I'm going to operate, if I'm going to live at a higher level, I have to operate f forward? From. No, no, that's wrong. If I'm going to live at a higher level, I have to operate slash conduct you did great. You did great. <laughs> I have to operate or conduct my life from higher levels. So I do have a part to play. Like, K sera sera doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Okay, I gave my life to Jesus. Where's my miracle? It's like, oh, no, you gave your life to Jesus and you now opened up the reality of your spirit man coming alive. So let's get into today's message. 
unsanctified thinking is the title of the message. You can have sanctified thinking or unsanctified thinking. And uh, we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, well, let's start at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even, even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal, for where envy strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And I wanted to highlight there that you, when you and I come into relationship with God, you are not a mere mortal anymore. Indicators that I'm operating out of carnality is that there's envy, and strife among us. I want to get into the right message because I'm not. I'm wondering where my notes are. Here we go. Much better. So, the opposite of envy. So, when I'm, when I'm living out of the Spirit, and I'm going to give you three different traits because the Bible tells us that we're a, a triune being, that we're, 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 we're a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. And there's attributes to our soul, but there's also attributes to our, our spirit. And I'm, I'm going to teach on that a little bit today, but just before I do that, the opposite of envy. So it says, for you are still carnal where there's envy, strife, divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Well, the opposite of envy is generosity. The opposite of envy is contentness, friendliness, goodwill, kindness, love, loving, pleasure, goodwill, satisfaction, respect, sympathy, friendship, sweetness, easiness, affection, Charity, warm-heartedness, kindness, forgiveness, regard, generosity of spirit, peace, ease, composure, joy, sanction, delight, advantage, cheer, encouragement, calmness. The opposite of an angry or hostile struggle, which is um, strife, the opposite of strife is harmony, peace, accord, agreement, a calmness. So if I'm walking with my spirit, there's a calmness about me. There's a peace about me. There's a generosity about me because I recognize that God will meet all my needs. If something unexpected happens, life happens. I have a choice. Am I going to stay in the spirit or am I going to slip down into a lower dimension? This is the fight is that if I'm going to operate out of a higher dimension, I've got to think and realize that the tools available to me are there to get into and stay in that higher, you know, a new age person would say a higher consciousness. You actually, as a Christian, have a higher consciousness that if God is for me, who can be against me? My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them. Or him, it says, which is either or. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord wants to deliver you and I out of them. The opposite of division is unification, is fusion, interlocking, 
coupling, consolation, junction, combination, melding, hookup. That's what the local church is. We're, we're supposed to be working together to such a degree that our root systems are intertwined so that if somebody tries to pull somebody out of the church or an event or the, ultimately the enemy is trying to pull someone out, what it's doing is it's pulling on all the other roots. I talked about last week, 1 John 3.20, for even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, this would be new today. Very powerful. I'm sure you've heard this scripture very well known. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the soul in the spirit. So other than the word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12 there, the soul and the spirit cannot be separate. So if I've done a funeral service or when I was in funeral service and heard a lot of funerals preached or spoken, the preacher many times would say, you know, the spirit of our dearly beloved has gone on. And then a few lines later, the soul of our loved one is no longer on the earth has gone on. It's because those, that word soul and spirit can be interchanged. It cannot be separated. Your soul and your spirit is going to go on. Your body, this earthly body, when it's done its course on earth, will go into the ground and go back to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. From dust you came, from dust you return. Your spirit and your soul continue on. Does anybody know the three attributes of the soul? We talk about them all the time. Mind, will, and emotions. Okay, and most of the time when we operate out of our soul, those three things will operate together. My mind, I see something in a store. My willpower starts to, gee, I, I like that thing. And then my emotions, yeah, it's been a rough week. I deserve that. And I go out and buy whatever it is. My mind, will, and my emotions operate together. But the spiritual person that is operating at a higher level, okay? Three things that your spirit man, and, and this is obviously when you become born again. That's why you need to be born again because the spirit portion of a human being is deadened to the life of Christ until there is a connection made. It's, it's, it's disconnected. It's not operating at its potential. It's basically being dragged along by its soul. So it's really big deal when you say, I want to connect God with you, or I want to, I want to give my life to you. Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Hebrews chapter 3 I believe it's verses one and two, right in the beginning of Hebrews there. I don't, do I have it in my notes? I might. Yes. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but trust me, it's there or look it up. But it talks about Jesus Christ is the great apostle and high priest of our confession. So Jesus in the Old Testament, the high priest was the one that, that was able to... Uh, um, cast judgment, I guess, on, on, on sin, or, or he, he was the, the, known as the highest. And in, in, in uh, the New Testament, the apostle, the Bible tells us that in the church is the apostle is first. Well, guess what? Who lives on the inside of you is Jesus Christ. So you have the apostle and high priest on the inside of you. So Rather than giving you three words to describe your spirit man, it's easier for me to, to give you the function of your spirit man. So the first one, if you're taking notes, is when you become born again, when your spirit becomes alive, when Jesus Christ, the great apostle and high priest, comes on the inside of you, your conscience becomes awakened. 
You know, it, it's always fun. You know, there's a season that a new believer will go through. And it feels like they're saying sorry all the time. I'm really sorry. I, I just, I, I, I thought, I thought a bad thought about you. I just wanted to apologize. I, I remember I went through this season, and and some of the people close to me actually said, "Would you just stop? You're actually irritating us. You're apologizing because you stepped on an ant on the sidewalk. Let it go." But there was a hypersensitivity. My conscience comes alive, or your conscience. And it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, and it's talking about the Gentiles, and verse 14 tells us it's the Gentiles, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing them. Your conscience comes alive to a new level, to moral law. And that's a true sign of, of somebody that's healthy, that's not behaving like a mere man. They don't have a seared conscience. They, they actually know when they're doing something wrong. Romans chapter 1 tells us the danger of suppressing our conscience. You know, even little children know when they're doing something because they haven't really been tainted yet by the things of the world. There's, there's an element there. And even the unbeliever, because the DNA of God is on them, there is an element of it. But when you become born again, you are more aware of, wow, I said something there that did not impart grace to the hearer. Because that's what we're called to do. We're, in call, we're called to, when we connect with one another, even if it's if it's a challenge, we're called as believers to live at a higher level. Our job, Ephesians 4, tells us we need to impart grace to the hearer. So you are, you are taking the dunamis, you know, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon you, right? So if, if you're going to operate at a higher level that I was signs and wonders, well, Yeah, signs and wonders. Some of those signs and wonders are that I am imparting in every situation that I'm in, I have the ability to impart dunamis, grace, the power of God to do what truth demands to the hearer. Another example scripturally would be in 1 Samuel 24, 5, when David, you don't need to turn there, but when when David cut cut the robe of Saul's um, gown. Remember, David was being hunted by Saul. And and David snuck in and he cut cut the robe. It says in in, uh, 1 Samuel 24, 5, now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. So the heart or the spirit man of, of David He had a conscience. He knew he he had done something that he shouldn't have done. Number two, when you become born again in your spirit man, because it's the word of God that is actually able to discern between the soul and the spirit, it will get in, in between there. But the spirit man is what we're talking about. You're able to spiritually discern things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, For what man knows the thing of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So you have the ability, and again, the world sometimes operates in this. Twins. One twin will have an inkling that there's something with their twin and they pick them up, pick up on the phone and say, what happened? You know, oh, there was a, tr- a, a, a problem and it was at this time and whatever. Oh, I, I felt that. But that is very limited compared to when you and I have a spirit man that has been awakened and the great apostle and high priest comes and lives on the inside of us. We now can be exactly pinpoint accurate where we can have a word of knowledge. We can have a, uh, something manifest where there's a discernment heightened, like it sounds right, it looks right, but something's not right. And you can sharpen your discernment by reason of use. So if I'm going to live at a higher level, if I'm, if I'm going to live, then I need to start to operate out of that higher level. I need to take heed who is parachuting into my life. What, what, 
did the enemy send this person into my life or did God send this person into my life? And when we're imparting grace, two things are going to happen. Either the person will move on and move out of my life or that person will stay in my life and the bond will become closer. I think there's three stages that friendships go through. Number one is there's a an interest, an infatuation. It's a new thing and you're excited. You get to know one another. And then the second phase is that there's some sort of crisis that happens. There's a letdown. You see people's humanity. And then the third stage is either you overlook the offense, which is if you overlook the offense, then grace will be imparted to you, the power to, the truth demands, or you will reject and move away. God is looking for his church, his body to embrace one another. Spiritual discernment is so important. You know, love, part of love is understanding. You, 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 you are able to love when you have an understanding. An example of that is there was a, a, a bus full of people, shoulder to shoulder, and I think it was in the, the United States. I believe it's a true story. And, and it was a hot day. The, it was very uncomfortable. And this man got on the bus. He had three little boys and they were running up and down the bus and just creating a havoc. Everybody on the bus was like, what is this guy's problem? They're angry, agitated. Christians were on that bus. Why is this guy dealing with his kids? And then somebody finally had enough nerve to go up to him and say, hey, hey like, can you get your three boys under control? I know they're, it looks like their age is like three, seven, and nine, but they're, they're up and down. And the man said, I'm so, so sorry. We just came from the hospital. My wife just passed away. These boys just lost their mother. Oh, understanding just came. Guess what happened on that bus? Grace came. Suddenly, everybody on the bus wanted to help the father, got his name, set up a, a list of, can we come over? Our church has a, a meal program, whatever. Do you see the difference? If we're going to live at a higher level, why do you have all those marks on your body? Why do you dress that way? Why have you got black all around your eye? Find out. Hey, just... I'd, I'd like to get to know you. I discern that God loves you. I'm a Christian and I have a conscience that you keep coming into my life. I keep seeing you every time I go to the post office. You're here at the same time. Why is that? Ding, 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 ding. Maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to put you together. But I'm scared of those people. Guess what? Perfect love casts out all fear. Number three. This is probably the most amazing point of when you and I are operating out of a born-again spirit that the great apostle and high priest lives on the inside of us, we actually have the ability to fellowship with God. It says in John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So somebody that is not born again cannot have fellowship with God. They can have an encounter with God. You and I are called to be a catalyst of that. But there is something about when the dew is still on the roses, he meets me, you know, I'm quoting a song obviously, right? He meets me in the garden. And when you and I have that quiet place, that we pull away and we fellowship with God. And there's something about when you fellowship with God that His grace gets on you. His love gets on you. When, in, when we talk about love, there's a list in 1 Corinthians and, and, and theologians 
tell us that when Paul, whenever Paul makes a list, I think there's seven or eight attributes of love. Paul, in his writing style, obviously unctioned by the Holy Spirit, it's the first and the last point in Paul's list of things are the most important things. So when Paul lists the attributes of love, the very first attribute is love is patient. And do you know what the last one is? Never fails. So theologians would say, because Paul, in his writing style, he'd want to come in with a bang. Woo! Hey, love is patient. That's the most important thing. If you're, lo- I'm a Christian. Oh, great. You're patient then. And the second most, or an, another one of the most, I think it never fails. God's calling us to live out of a, like, <coughs> That was, I apologize, that was horrible in a microphone. Uh, God is calling his church to come up higher. We're, we're no longer identified by a title, oh, I'm a Christian. No, we're identified because of a lifestyle. What is it about your life that, well, I, I, I live out of, and, and this is what I... Th- we're going to get into more next week, living out of the fourth dimension. Because we're not able to do it on our own. If you just pop over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think you were there. Go over one chapter to chapter 4. And it says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one is found faithful. So we are handling access to the realm of the Spirit. There should be no strife, no envy, no divisions among us. There should be this ability to properly discern. And when we're properly discerning, what is being infused is love into the situation because we have communion with God. Like if we're truly born again and operating out of a born again lifestyle, then our heart will remain healthy because we're operating the way God has called us to operate. Like Our soul and our spirit can't be separated. But in order to have a healthy soul spirit, the spirit man, we need to be doing those three points. I'll just give them to you again. Our conscience, knowing right from wrong so that we're quick to obey our conscience. Number two is that we're spiritually discerning things. You know, every day at three o'clock when I pick up the mail, and I meet this individual at the mailbox that I'm uncomfortable with, but why am I meeting there? We take some time in number three, of course, is that we're able to fellowship with God. So I'm going to take that and put those things together and say, why is it that every day at three o'clock I'm meeting this Lord? What is that? And then the Lord speaks to us. I want you to minister to them. I want you to pray for them. But God, I'm not able. I'm not. He's like, you're right. You're not able, but I'm able through you. And that is that higher, we start to operate now out of the fourth dimension because, you know, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So when literally when we say, you know, I can't do this, we we now invite his presence to say, but I can do it through you. And now suddenly the impossible, we start to do it. It becomes possible. And then just when we start to get comfortable, God takes us to a higher level. I want you to lay hands on the sick. I want you to command cancer to bow. I want you to share your testimony. What we are experiencing right now and I'm, I'm going to close with this, is that 
back in, I think it was around 315, Constantine was in charge. He was the, the king. Or the, and there was a thing called the Ni- Nietzschean or the Nietzschean Creed. I remember studying this in Bible school. And they actually changed the way Christianity was. And Constantine, up, you know, he, he basically empowered a pastoral model into all the churches. And what a pastoral model does is a pastoral model is set up so that people have their needs met. They go to church and they're looking for their needs met. Where the original design was similar to example that I would use is like McDonald's. What? What are you talking about? McDonald's. If I go to McDonald's in Huntsville, or I go to McDonald's in London, Ontario, or I go to McDonald's in Hong Kong, it's the same thing. When Jesus was alive on the earth and Jesus released his church, the job of the believers was to release his kingdom to come. So that he was, he was taking that, and I say McDonald's because the brand is the same everywhere you go, the packaging, the sign, whatever. So the apostolic model of the church started to get lost as early as 315, where people nowadays, you say, oh, I'm going to church. They have a completely different idea of what church is. They think it's like a a community club that you can sign up to knit socks for some uh, refugee in some foreign land, or, you know, you might have a book club or whatever, and you're going to get all your needs met there. You're just going to, and if you don't, if your needs aren't met there, you're going to go to the next church where they play cards on Tuesday night, and you can be a part of the card club. And, you know, if you throw in 20 bucks here and there to keep the pastor poor, that's it. The church has given away so much. We are to be leading in society. We are to be operating out of the four. That is the apostolic model. And that's, that's why I'm continuing to hit this. If I'm going to live at a higher level, then I have to operate and conduct my life from a higher level. Like I, I, I can't come to church with the idea that, oh, somebody didn't say hi to me. It's like, you're, you're behaving like a mere human being. You're there on Sunday morning to walk in that door full of life. That you're going to, everybody that you encounter on a Sunday morning, you're going to impart grace to them. And because you're watering others, Proverbs promises it, you will be watered as well. But you're going to be watered out of the fourth dimension. Otherwise, you are going to live at a very carnal, secular, oh, McGillicuddy's didn't say hi to us today. Did you notice they're driving that new car too? Honey, when are you going to get us a new car? I'm tired of this old thing. And it's just a fight breaks out. And it's, it's so carnal. That, just, that should not be. We got, high, we got higher priorities to take. We, we want to see our schools full of the glory of God. We want, we want to see, you know, equality in, in work, like it's spilling out. What are, the level of demonic. Linda and I, we, we can't hardly watch a Hallmark movie and there's stuff kissing and stuff and going on that, that it's like it's not normal. And we're shaking our head and saying everything's been infiltrated. Where's the Christians? Where's the Christians? Who, who's in charge here? We are. This is our, this is our region. This is our territory. But we got to start living at a higher level. Right, right here. Anyway, I'm going to go on and on and on and on and on. And if I... Heavenly Father, thank you. Whoa, there it is. God, I thank you for this congregation that they are set up. They are set up, God. Their conscience. I want to be sensitive to their conscience, Lord. They want, want to be operating it not, not out, of, uh, out of fear, but out of discernment. And Lord, out of fellowship with you. And that the word of God, when I read the word of God, that it is able to get in between my soul and spirit. It's able to, to divide those truths and heal my soul. Just the word of God. And I 
can operate out of a healthy walk with you. So I release right now that understanding that it is a big deal to be a born again Christian. I bless this house. I bless this congregation. I pray that all their needs this week, God, would be met out of the fourth dimension, which would spring up relationships and contacts and business and fellowship in this dimension. But the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, is at the center of all things. In Jesus' name, amen.